Hello and welcome to Broadband. Here at Broadband, we live by the philosophy that one needs other human beings to teach them how to be human. Our guide for today on this journey of communal actualization is Ahmed Ershad al Badr, a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu practitioner who is a member of the early movement to introduce the sport to Kuwait nearly a decade ago. I want to set the stage for this interview by shining the spotlight on three main points of focus for our dialogue. The first being Ahmed and his unique human journey. Next, I want to introduce you to the art of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, a sport that is not as globally mainstream as it should be. At least that's an argument that I make and I make quite often. And finally, I want to provide you, the listener, with insights on how this communal sport can add value to your everyday life. Without further ado, hello, Ahmed. Hi, Aziz. Thanks for the introduction. I'm, I'm really happy that we can have you here on board. And thank you so much for, uh, for being willing to join us. I mean, uh, thanks for having me. I, uh, I can really back what you guys are doing in terms of getting the community together, putting a light on the cultural aspect. I feel there is a gap there. And believe me, for us jujitsu guys, you give us an opportunity to talk about jujitsu, we'll never shut up. So thank you. Um, uh, I want to start this dialogue by learning about your early life. Who was Ahmed growing up as a young boy in Kuwait? If you ask my mom, she'll probably say I, I was a wild child, hellraiser, mischievous, always getting into trouble, but the, the polite type, you know, so I'd look for loopholes or gray areas and try to take advantage of those. And my parents needed a way to sort of like control all of this energy. And they pushed me into trying, you know, any sort of activity, sports, hobby, just one after the other. Anything you can imagine, horseback riding, uh, archery, tennis, golf, swimming, volleyball. My mom even tried religious schools, but I shut that down quick. Like it got to a point where I was, I even had a schedule of, of my parents' ins and outs. And, and, and I've, I'd have stolen the spare keys to the cars. So I used that schedule and just like steal cars when I was 13, 14 years old. And then, you know, I, I drove my parents crazy. <laughs> well, it, it's really interesting because your parents really adopted the whole let's tire him out until he just can't do any mischief uh, approach. Uh, now, in doing my research about your early life, and you just said something that really triggered this question for me, and I learned about a devastating car accident about 11 years ago in your life. How did that pivotal event shape your outlook on life? So to be honest, it, it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And the, the ironic thing is, like, I used to steal my parents' cars before getting a license and, you know, safe, nothing happens, a cautious driver, put it back, come back in one piece. But, you know, this car accident happened three days after I got my license. Wow, that's the irony. When you finally are able to actually drive legally, now the anarchist comes out, right? Now, <laughs> exactly. Maybe I was trying to prove a point. I don't know. So I wake up a week later, I'm in the hospital. I know I'm in the hospital. I don't know why I'm there. And I'm just like drugged up. I don't know if this is real. This isn't. Uh, I, I don't really know where I am. And as the days go by, I start to, to feel my body and, and I, I feel chest tubes going in through my chest, connected to machines, scars all over, you know. And so I, I ask, what's up? Why am I here? And they explained to me that I was uh, in a car accident and I, uh, my body slammed into the, the steering wheel and I have internal bleeding. So I look down and, and I see practically a zipper in my stomach. So the staples about like 10 centimeters from more, maybe 15 centimeters. And yeah, so the, they had to do exploratory surgery and there was about a 90% chance of me not surviving. And the whole time I was on that bed, all I could think about is if I have my health, I will never think about anything else. You know, it's the basic, you, you can't enjoy anything if you don't have your health. I started jujitsu a few months before that. So I made a vow to myself, if I have my health, I'll never stop training. And I'm trying to keep it ever since. So that's why it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Made me realize the little things. You know, you saying that it's the best thing that it's ever happened to you, I think wasn't the response that I was expecting at all. So I'm so happy that you took the silver lining 
from the whole experience. And that's essentially the story that, that you like to tell is the positive outlook of that story. But you had just mentioned that it was a long road to recovery and you had just started jujitsu earlier. So what was the road to, of, to recovery like from the hospital bed to the jujitsu mats for you? Was there a physical therapist in your life that you had to see very often or h- how'd you do it? Let, let me just be clear on that. I only say that this was the best thing that ever happened to me 11 years later. At the time, I despised it. It was the worst thing that ever possibly happened to me. You know, I was supposed to go to school in the States with my friends. I ended up in a wheelchair. So at the time, there were bad days and good days. On the bad days, I wish that 90% would have taken me. You know, I wish I would have been like gone and over this hell. But on the good days, I'd use that pain and, and just keep a goal in my head that I want to be stronger than ever. And you use that to propel yourself forward. So there were a few stages, like it it started out really tough because most of the the impact was on my chest and abdomen. So I was, I, I was basically being taught to breathe again. They gave me this little tool where I had to blow in it and there were three balls and the first ball would trigger the second ball to rise and the second for the, would trigger the third. And that was my goal at first. That was my goal. You know, get the third ball up there. And, and I, you had to chop it up in small pieces. If you look at yourself and look at where you were, you, you just lose hope. But breaking it up into small pieces. Okay, today I want to lift the second ball. Then after that, okay, today I want to stand for 15 minutes. After that, I want to take a walk. You know, I want to get up off of this wheelchair. And, and you just use those like small goals while having a big goal at the end. And, and, and you know, it just fits together. Nothing stronger than human determination. Wow. And, and nothing stronger than, than the human that's been knocked down and, and told that, you know, there's a 10% chance they'll, they'll survive and, and coming back in full fighting force. So, okay. So, so I guess switching gears into a more playful note. Um, you know, I, I've asked around you and, and I know you speak Spanish and you learn Spanish by dropping everything and moving to Peru for some time. I don't know if that was like the mischievous side of you, but how would you describe that journey? So I applied to masters and, and my main goal was to get into a school in Spain. So I start training like crazy on Duolingo. It's an app to learn languages, really easy to use and extremely effective. So I, I look into traveling to somewhere I can practice. So I've been training with a teacher using Duolingo. I want to, I want to use that, you know, and somewhere I can, I can actually uh, be tested. So I ask the guys, you know, hey, anyone wants to take a trip? You say South America, people go crazy. They think, what, what are, you want to mess with the cartel? Don't go down there. It's dangerous. So, you know, I ignore everyone. I book myself a trip alone to Peru. I head over there. I mean, the thing is, like, I guess I look Peruvian because our guide for one of the trips there would always introduce me as his assistant. So I speak one line in perfect Spanish. And then I ask all the follow-up questions. I'm like, que? Que? And then they realize I'm Kuwaiti. And they're like, you're a Kuwaiti in Peru trying to learn Spanish. Like, what's your story, man? I mean, that, that's amazing. And it's something that, that really, I guess, would be a big uh, insight into your personality because you're a person who's just very open to all these new and exciting experiences. Nothing happens in the comfort zone, right? 100%. Uh, you've had and you continue to have an action-packed life from serious physical recoveries to adding a third language that you can flirt in to your arsenal. And I really want to talk to you about your involvement with the sport. Uh, but first, I think it serves the audience well to describe this martial arts. So how would you describe Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to your grandmother? Okay, so most of the time when I try to describe my martial arts, you get locked into the idea, ah, oh, karate, okay, okay. So... What, how I would describe it is, is a martial arts that uses your opponent's strength against them to control and de-escalate a situation. Like I, I, I like to use the term de-escalation because you're mostly trying to just like calm things down in jujitsu. 
I always say that if speed chess, yoga, and wrestling had an unconventional love child, it would be jujitsu. Oh my God. That's, I could have said it better myself. That's amazing. I'm going to use that. (laughs) (laughs) And that's how I would describe it to my grandma. But then I think that she would ask what an unconventional love child is. And I think that's a conversation that I would like to avoid. That's that's a whole other problem you're going to have to deal with. (laughs) Exactly. So maybe use that, but not to your grandma. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) How did you find yourself on the Brazilian jiu-jitsu mats? I mean, it all started when we were we were little kids, you know, uh, most of our group, like we, we grew up together. So Yusuf Al-Babtain, his older brother, Abdul Mahsin Al-Babtain, we knew he was training in the States. So he'd been there for like about 10 more years. And we knew he was training with, with like legends. And so when Mahsin came back to Kuwait, you know, he, he rents an Arabi stadium. Basically, almost free, just like everyone bring, scrapes up what they can to pay the rent, which was like absolutely nothing. And we were sort of the guinea pigs at first, you know, his little brother's friends. And we knew he trained with the legendary Hoist Gracie, so we wanted to, to, to taste that knowledge. And at first, we were just like sort of excited, but then it got a little bit repetitive, as, as anything does. And luckily, that's when I had my car accident, which kept me into it. So you, you said that, that you know, it, it got pretty re- repetitive. And, and I can imagine that as, as a child who's just maybe not uh, super focused when it comes to, to life, you know, and, and loving the mischievous uh, deeds and acts. What made it so that you're dedicated to jiu-jitsu, even when it started getting monotonous and started to become this kind of routine rhythm? So like the good thing with my parents were that they forced me to join or, or practice sports, but they would only force me for so long. So like they'd force me for the first three months, you know, make sure that uh, I wasn't quitting because of the discipline issue. It was more of a preference issue. You really don't know if you have a discipline issue or you just genuinely don't like something, but you have to go through a certain time period for you to figure yourself out. Hey guys, this is the part of the podcast where people usually tell you to buy this product or subscribe to this service, but we don't have any sponsors yet. So we'll sell ourselves instead. We have four simple asks. One, please subscribe if you haven't already. Two, share the podcast, share it with your friends, share with your family and share it with a stranger. Start a conversation. Three, check out the show notes. You can find all the references that we've already made and are about to make on there. And four, engage with us on Instagram and email. Enjoy the rest of the show. Do you remember an early experience where your ego was put in check by jiu-jitsu? All the time. The first six months of jiu-jitsu are just ego checks. Like whenever you think you're the, the, the badass brawler at the gym, you know, some little scrawny, goofy looking person just teaches you a huge lesson. And, and you know, you just have to take it. So time and time again, you're just immune, you know, you don't judge a person by the way they look, you don't think you're better than anyone, you're humbled. It teaches you humility by force, let's say. And that's something that is a byproduct of you just going to one class. I mean, uh, Sam Harris wrote in his blog post, the pleasures of drowning, that jiu-jitsu does a great job in separating what's true from what's delusion. Uh, and that no matter how big and strong you are, you can go on the mat and some teenager can choke you out and wipe the floor with you. And that's something that I've experienced for sure. And it's something that you've experienced in the very first, in the very first class and, and, and probably you can still experience. I mean, there's some, there's some 15 year olds that are very dangerous. 100%. I guess a lot of the haters probably would compare jiu-jitsu to like some other martial art. And, and when they see two grown men in what appears to be pajamas wrestling on the floor, I, I think they just like, oh, okay, I call bullshit. And, and I mean, the reason that I do jiu-jitsu is something really stuck with me, a specific quote from Socrates. Uh, and he says, it, it is a shame for a man to grow old without seeing the beauty and strength of which his body is capable. And that applies to women. I mean, this is not only for a quote for men. Exactly. It's like, it's like the science of how the body works, how the, what sort of mobility you should have, what sort of range of motion. You know, if you exceed that range of motion, then you hurt the person. And, and I think it's genius, you know. 
it uses leverage and their movement. It's it's a lazy martial arts, you know. It'll get you where you want to go using the least effort possible, and that's what I love it. Phenomenal, and unlike other martial arts where you can reach the pinnacle and tie a black belt on your waist after let's say three or five years, it takes like ten to thirteen years to earn your jujitsu black belt. So, what does that say about the character of the jujitsu black belt? I mean, it's it's such a long process. There's jujitsu has the least amount of belts in any martial arts and the longest amount of time to to complete those belts, but like. It, most of the people that are in jujitsu, the, the, the whole system deters anyone that's actually just in it for the belt. You know, it's too long of a commitment. So those belt chasers, they want the title, they want the, the glory. But, you know, Hoist Gracie used to say, a black belt only covers two inches of your ass. You got to cover the rest yourself. But, you know, if your goal is a black belt, you can buy one online right now. That is true. It doesn't mean anything. That is true. Well, okay, uh, I think this is a really good time to bring up the point that you mentioned earlier, that, you know, if you keep showing up, eventually they're going to have to give you a black belt. But there's a story that I, I heard while I was in class that said that, you know, originally there was no such thing as a black belt. There was only white belts. So the longer the students trained, the darker the belt became. And eventually that dirty old belt was a symbol of proficiency. Now, I'm not sure if there's any truth to that story. I wouldn't doubt that story of the, the, of the white belts, like turning darker the longer you train. Like for Hoist Gracie used to, used to, used to do his seminars and his father's old blue belt. So I, I guess it's just like, you know, the blue belt, the system doesn't mean much. Yeah, and and his father and for the for the people that don't know who Hoyce Gracie is, Hoyce Gracie is the son of the founder of Jiu Jitsu, Elio Gracie. And uh, Elio Gracie went his entire life and career wearing a blue belt around his waist instead of the the black belt, the coveted black belt. So there could be some truth to that story. But uh, do you remember a moment in time where where the lessons that you learned in Jiu Jitsu? has come in handy uh, at, you, at work or with personal relationships? So at work, you deal a lot with egos and just being able to identify, you know, what's ego, what's confidence, what's bullshit. <laughs> it gives you a real edge and jujitsu puts you in that position because it's like uh, you're dealing with the realest form of the human. You can't fake that. And so those skills are transferable. And when you talk with someone, you can sense the level of confidence. You can, you can tell if that person is inflating himself. And, and I'm not saying that you judge people, but you just understand how they're dancing and, you know. Yeah, uh, uh, jiu-jitsu jiu gives you the ability to read people because when you're on the mats, if you don't read the person in front of you well, then you're probably going to get choked out. So, you know, that uh, high, high stress environment, even though it was a safe and controlled environment, teaches you how to read people in, in a way that you can apply to any instance in your life. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you have competed and you continue to compete. So when competing, what is one thing that is everything you dreamed it would be? And what is a harsh reality of the competition setting? Everything I dreamed it would be uh, probably the the award ceremony at the end, you know, having all of the the photographers, the crowds cheering. You get your medal. You're on TV. Your sponsors are sharing that. Your friends are tagging you, and it's, it's an awesome sensation. Maybe things that that aren't so good or aren't so <laughs> comfortable are, are probably the, the six months of stress racking back and forth mental sort of distress that you're in and I mean competitions are tough you know, you, you're training six months for five minutes you know and if that five minutes doesn't go the way you wanted it to go because of any number of reasons it, it hurts sometimes that's why what I love about the jujitsu community is, is you know, there's, a, there's a, this old quote, you don't lose in jujitsu. You either win or you learn. So, you know, that just not having a fear of losing just makes you so much more creative, confident. You're just excelling you know, in all areas if you're not afraid of failure. I like that. Uh, so let's get into ways that jujitsu can add value to everyone's life. 
First, let me ask this question. What's so right about jujitsu that got you hooked? To me, it made sense. It's mainly the combination of activating both your mind and your body. Consider this, let's say a conventional gym, you're just lifting weights. So your, your mind's on autopilot thinking about everything, the news, the girl you just saw, the, I don't know, the weather tomorrow. Your brain's not in it 100%. But when you're playing jujitsu, your brain needs to be in it because it's like chess. You know, you move that guy's hand, how will he react? So you fake one way, you make him move the other way, and you try to manipulate sort of the movements while he's doing the same to you. And it's as much a mental battle as it is a physical one. So I, I like the activation of and the connection of both mind and body. Fantastic. And, and this kind of reminds me of something that Dr. Gabor Mate described as addiction kind of being a way to escape suffering. So you mentioned that it's a fantastic way uh, to activate both mind and body. So what ways can jiu-jitsu help someone get over emotional and mental hardships uh, in their mind by using their physicality? people really dwell on those negative emotions that they're having. And, and you know, they just can't think about anything else until it's totally consuming their mind. And I think a healthy way to, to sort of give your mind a breather is to try jujitsu. Because, you know, like I said before, there's nothing else you, that'll take your mind off bullshit things like um, surviving a choke. When you're getting choked out, you're not thinking about anything else. So that's exactly it. And I've had this in my personal life with my experiences. Jiu-Jitsu really helped me get through a really emotional and, and really distressful time in my life in, in the sense that I couldn't stop obsessing and thinking about this terrible thing that happened to me. And the only time where I was in the moment and present and happy was on the mats because of exactly what you said. You had to be present or if you weren't, if you weren't present, you're going to be put in a compromising position. Yeah, uh, so how does jujitsu allow its students to be comfortable with the uncomfortable? I mean, when you have a, a person that's 90 kilos and he's on top of you and you can barely breathe and you still have to think and get out of it. How, what's that like? The thing with jujitsu, the beautiful thing is that you can go all out and train for as long as you like. And then whenever you're in a bad position, you just immediately tap out. It's not like other martial arts where you're getting, you know, smashed on the head or kicked in the face. You know, the, 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 the timeline for jujitsu can be for as long as you like. Like something I noticed with jujitsu is, is that there is a large amount of, of older people or an older generation that still train. And they and they can because, you know, jujitsu is, is the gentle art. It's gentle on, on your body. So you can keep doing it forever and gives you the sort of the, the option to do it sustainably for good. Well, I mean, and you just said uh, jiu-jitsu is the gentle art and jiu-jitsu literally translates to gentle art in Japanese. How important is it to encourage women to participate in the sport? I, I, to be honest, I think women need it more than men. I mean, just having a set of skills to defend yourself would be extremely useful for women being placed in, in bad situations. And something I tell my sisters all the time is, you know, a person that's, you know, trying to sexually assault you is not going to stand in front of you and box. You know, the person's going to, the person's going to sneak up behind you. And once and he's already initiated contact, you need to understand how to not only subdue the person, but run away, like, and, and how to do it in the most effective way possible. So that's why I think it's extremely important for women to, and, and more important than men to, for women to practice jiu-jitsu. Um, what's an important message that you want our audience to take away from this discussion? I would say find a hobby you love doing that keeps you active, that works both your body and your mind. I'm not here to preach a healthy lifestyle. I'm here to preach an active lifestyle. Just, just find something that excites you, that gets you active, and just keep doing it. Even when it gets boring or tough, just keep doing it. And we talked specifically about jujitsu, but I mean, you were a person who experimented with all sorts of sports and activities from horseback riding to tennis, uh, the list went on, right? And we're not here specifically preaching, go to jujitsu, 
but we're here saying get out there and find your community and find your your niche whatever excites you ahmed thank you so much for joining thank you so much aziz for having me and uh looking forward to this show um i mean i know it's going to be big this podcast would not be possible without your support so please subscribe to our podcast share it with your friends and family check out the show notes for any references made and engage with us on instagram and email thank you Thank you.